Okay. Recording Take in progress. Take it away, Mr. Ashby. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for letting me come and talk about this. I got a call from Jay Matlock, who is a new member of the Fort Armstrong chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution in Rock Island, right across the river. We meet there once uh, a month during the uh, good months, you know, the, from uh, March to uh, October. <laughs> the rest of the time we're in Florida. No, <laughs> some people are in Florida, but not everyone. Anyway, uh, so, and but be, by the way, this time in Florida, they don't meet in the SAR, they meet in the winter time. <laughs> it's too hot there for them. I'm gonna try to press play here, see if that works. And uh, yeah, that worked fine, okay. So um, I'm here to talk about the three societies, as was mentioned, the Sons of the American Revolution, the General Society of the War of 1812, and the Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War. And these are all male lineage society, and we require a birth certificate that is, identifies the sex of the individual as male. And if it's not on there, you have to go back and get one from the health department, because they will issue one. Okay, so at any rate, let me first talk about the SAR. The SAR has uh, 34,000 members nationwide. It's probably about a tenth the size of the DAR. <laughs> They're pretty big. And uh, so uh, we have a couple of chapters in the area, of course, the one in Rock Island, and it's a small chapter. We formed it a few years ago and with about 15 members, and since then, about 10 of those 15 members either died or passed or, or moved out of the area. So we we're cut down to quite a few and we just recently added a new member and we have a couple other members uh, from a, a nearby chapter that want to come here. So we're continuing to, to go with it and uh, it's, a, it's a good thing. Anyway, uh, the SAR's mission, as you can see there, is uh, dedicated to be uh, patriotic, historical and uh, educational. And we're there to promote fellowship among the descendants of the, uh, the patriots that fought in the American Revolution and uh, who sacrificed everything basically to give us the United States of America and to inspire them and the community at large to a more profound reverence for the principles of government founded by our forefathers. Uh, to foster true patriotism, patriotism and to maintain and extend the institutions of American freedom. So let me just show you a little bit about what's going on. Uh, the top right-hand uh, picture that you see up there is at our, one of our chapter meetings. The people that are dressed in Revolutionary War garb are uh, the color guard. We have a color guard in each chapter and uh, they help out. We've helped the DAR out for various events. Uh, uh, we have uh, musket salutes for various things that go on. We have a present the colors for uh, the society of the lineage societies over in East Peoria once a year. I don't know if, if any of you ladies been over there for that, and perhaps not. And, uh, and this uh, picture in the upper left is, um, you can see the two younger kids. Uh, those are grandkids of the gentleman in the middle. <laughs> he just brought those two in and he had two more he's gonna bring in. So, and then the gentleman in the very center is Dr. Alan Campbell from Peoria. Uh, and he received a, an award at, from the state level, and which was presented that night. And Mike Tubbs and Jim Miller, who are part of the color guard. And that's our flag there, the uh, uh, yellow and white and blue flag uh, that uh, is part of that. And we meet every month in, in Peoria uh, from uh, March to October at various, it's kind of a restaurant's tour of a 10 county area because we cover 10 different counties, including uh, Peoria County. And then we don't include Rock Island County. So Rock Island is, is part of the Fort Armstrong chapter. At any rate, the center photo is uh, our award winner at national for uh, uh, the, oh boy, when you get old, you have trouble. <laughs> uh, the, um, oh, what's, what's the actual name of it? I gotta think of that for a second. This slip my mind, I should know. I've done this for a long time. I'll open one of my brochures here and remind myself. Orations, that's what it is. For the ration contest at National. And that lady uh, won uh, 
$6,000 scholarship for winning the oration in which she, had, she actually gets up there and talks for five minutes without any notes or anything and with, you know, doing all the appropriate hand motions and everything else. And, and it's a, on a subject she wrote. And um, you can see the president general is behind her in the center and the head of the orations committee at national is next to him. This was just at our meeting um, this past um, week in um, um, Orlando, Florida. We, had a, we have a national meeting, which is called a Congress, once a year. And she got up and spoke. And the gentleman to the right over there that looks like he has a lot of merit badges, he has every one of the merit badges. He was our Eagle Scout scholarship winner. winner, winner. He won $10,000 scholarship. And we also give them out all the way to 15th place scholarships, but they're a lot reduced as you get past the first three. Uh, this uh, array of uh, gentlemen in uh, Revolutionary War garb at the bottom is our color guard that we had at the National Congress. And it's in the Methodist Church there. And we have a memorial service that honor, in this case, there were 350 people had passed away nationally in, over the last year. So we have a, a service for that. And they carried a flag, each one of those guys. So you can imagine how many flags there were, <laughs> and it's other than the drummer. And our, our uh, president general is uh, the same gentleman there is right here in the center, uh, you can see. So uh, we do a lot of youth awards kind of things. Uh, it, then the other thing in the bar bottom corner is a poster contest that we have nationwide for uh, grammar schools. Now the state of Illinois, unfortunately doesn't have a chairman for that. So we, had, we can't have one, but I'm, working with the state president to try to get one designated. But we had wonderful displays of, you know, uh, of Americana with the posters and also they have a brochure contest for junior high kids. And uh, so we have those two things. We also have a uh, essay contest and ROTC contest. And I didn't show all the pictures up here because <laughs> I didn't think we'd have time to talk about them all. But anyway, we have to do a lot of youth awards things. We do a lot of patriotic grave markings. We had four cemetery markings in June at various places in Illinois in which we, the whole color guard got together, you know, a portion thereof and fired our muskets and did a program on, uh, you know, when uh, for a particular patriot that was buried at the cemetery, but we put this cemetery marker in the front of the cemetery so the people in the community know that they have somebody that fought in the American Revolution right in their community. And so they don't have to look around for a gravesite or gravestone. They can get all in it, all the information. It's a big plaque about 12 feet high and it has, it's all cast aluminum and wording is all, you know, cast into there. So you can see exactly what that person did. And we have put up to six patriots on one of those things at various cemeteries, but it's really kind of cool. So basically the organization is, uh, we have local chapters that meet monthly, March to October for dinner, revolutionary war-based programs and business. The state society meets uh, quarterly for dinner and do the same kind of things, but this is at more of a governing level. You, uh, everybody's in, invited, but usually we'll have at least the chapter presidents and, uh, and we have 15 chapters in the state. Um, Around, around the state and, uh, and other officers of the state uh, that are part of that. But we also have many members that are just normal SAR members that come to it. And then the National Society meets three meetings a year, a spring and fall in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, in which it's a kind of a education thing and leadership. And uh, also it's a, uh, a meeting of all the committees of national level. So you, if you're a member that, you know, just from a chapter, you wanna come and sit in on the committees and see what they're talking about or find out what the program is and the trustees meet there as well. I'm a trustee from Illinois right now. And uh, so we have to vote on financial matters and, you know, things that the contracts and that kind of thing. So we'll meet there as well. But uh, all the members are able to sit on, in on that and we'll have presentations and all the new things that are going on. And then every July, the Congress meets in cities around the country. This year was Orlando. Last year was Savannah. Uh, the previous year, let's see, was it was in uh, Washington State. 
uh, Renton, Washington. It was on a lake and that's, that's we had to be a good place because that's where Bill Gates and uh, the other guy that owns uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the software things lives at the Lake Washington anyway. And so it was really beautiful. And then previous year, I think was uh, Orange County, California and, and back to Boston and all kinds of places. So, and uh, we do Revolutionary War things, memorial services, I mentioned, the uh, installation of new officers, recognition, meals, business, and so on. So that's how that proceeds. Now uh, membership, uh, an upstanding male applicant of any age, you don't have to be 18. In fact, I submitted applications with a zero in age <laughs> because they were less than one. <laughs> so, you know, I have a grandparent that wanted to give his son uh, uh, or his grandson something. And so they gave him a, a membership anyway. And so the joining costs are $200, but this is for a, a normal regular adult or less for a junior, which is somebody under the age of uh, 18. And uh, also there's a memorial membership in which you can like your father, you can get him in in a memorial membership, but because they never collect any more dues from me after they prove it, they want more money for that. So it's $200 joining, which is a $100 national fee. The normal dues are $50. The state fee is $20. The state dues is 20 and the chapter dues are 20. So all in all, the yearly dues are $80, but initially it, you gotta pay $200 and it also includes one year dues. And every chapter has different fees, but uh, the two that I belong to uh, are both $10. <laughs> the one in Peoria, which is called Captain Zeely Moss and the uh, one in uh, Rock Island. And you can visit uh, members.sar.org uh, and begin filling out an application. You have to uh, register first and then begin filling out the application or you can contact me tdashb at me.com or 309-202-4067. I do text or voice. So, and I do have uh, little handouts that I can pass up afterwards that will uh, give you all the information on how to contact all, all these things. And I have brochures on the SAR and I have a, a sample application for some of the others. One of the things I forgot to do was uh, get my hat on. <laughs> Okay, so you know, I'm a member of the Color Guard and I have a couple different, three different uniforms actually that I can wear. One is my Patriot ancestor who fought in Virginia, one of my Patriot ancestors in the Virginia line. So I have the blue and the red facings on the on there. And then uh, I have a Patriot that fought uh, with General George Rogers Clark in from Kentucky. And I have a hunter shirt and a, uh, other things that I wear with that and so on. So, um, and then I have what they call a National Color Guard uniform, which is the Color Guard uniform that um, what they call the lifeguard of General Washington War, which was the buff and blue colors and a red vest. And um, they were a horse unit, so they had boots and they had a hat with a plume over the top, you know, one of those things. So anyway, uh, I'll go on to the next one, but I'll take this hat off. <laughs> and put my other hat on, but I got to do a little doctoring on this one. I was gonna talk about metaphorical hats. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Got the hats. Okay, so <laughs> the next one is the General Society of the War of 1812. Now, take a look at the bottom of the slide. You'll notice there's only 500 members nationwide. <laughs> it's been around since about 1819. It's been there a long, long time, but people die, you know, and things like that. And uh, they, in fact, the Illinois Society kind of reorganized uh, back in, oh, I think it was a 2007, uh, the last time, just because it, a lot of people dissolved and went away. And so it is an older organization and uh, the members uh, recognize remember and recognize the sacrifices of those that fought in the War of 1812 and preserve its records, history, and memorials and graves. Um, and they gather in camaraderie with their descendants and they make the public aware of their dedicated service, the, the people that fought in the, in the War of 1812. 
and they cherish the institutions of freedom and love of country. So uh, there was quite a uh, recent celebration at Fort McHenry. You see a picture of the flag over at Fort McHenry in the bottom, and that's the war cry of the, the 1812 war cry, which is the quarterly mag, uh, little newsletter that comes out from the uh, national organization. And this shows a, a peace treaty being signed uh, between uh, Great Britain and the US. And some of the ships like the USS Constitution fought in the War of 1812, which is still uh, docked at, in Boston. Did you know that? You can get on the ship today and it's still commissioned in the US Navy. And it does get out in Boston Harbor and turn around every, every year, <laughs> faces a different direction. And uh, we actually had a member, a, a uh, state society president, Bruce Talbot, who is a direct descendant of the first captain of the uh, um, Constitu USS Constitution. Um, what, and also he had other relatives that fought in the Revolutionary War. <laughs> That's how I know him from that. But the um, anyway, the War of the 1812 uh, organization, uh, I'll uh, give you a little bit about that. State Society meets for fellowship in uh, a fort in Southern Illinois about, oh, I'm sorry, that's the, yeah, the State Society, once a year uh, for program business. And usually it's in Southern Illinois. And then they'll gather for like grave markings or um, for the, they have their own color guard, gather for grave markings and um, other activities at whatever site that's going to happen, but they don't really have chapter meetings, you know, around the state. It's just the state society meets once a year with all the people and the residents, depending on where you live, might get involved in the various other activities. The general society meets, general being the national uh, society meets once a year for 1812 related tours. For instance, they met in the building uh, in Philadelphia where, uh, People debated the, um, uh, the war with Britain and so on. Uh, they met at um, Fort Ticonderoga. I'm not sure what I'm at, the Fort um, um, McHenry, you know, when they had the, uh, the deal there. They all met for the Battle of New Orleans in New Orleans with Andrew Jackson. That was where my relative fought from Kentucky. He went down the Mississippi to uh, Fort New Orleans and fought during the War of 1812. So. And this year, right now, actually says, the, no, that's the wrong one. Uh, I'm thinking of a different one. <laughs> the 7th through the 10th of September is when uh, they're gonna be meeting in Plattsburgh, New York uh, the, for the General Society. So now membership on that one is um, uh, made up of high, gentlemen of high caliber over 18 can you can fill out the application online actually what we'd recommend you doing is downloading the application to your computer fill it out there save it and then uh, you can send it on to um, you have to print two copies you can't send it electronically so if you don't have a printer capable but uh, it's um, makes it a little bit of a problem but uh, you could print it to a zip drive and bring it over to one of the printer outfits and they'd print it for you that's uh, it's sixty five dollars, uh, which is twenty five dollar dues and forty dollar fees at the uh, national level. Become a national at large member. Now, if you wanted to become a state member, the dues are the same, and they can be sent to this Lynn Hargis uh, at uh, in East. Uh, I'm sorry, Falcon Drive in East or Highlands, Illinois, and uh, and then you can be. He has. He would recommend that you send the kind of a rough copy, and then he looks it over and recommends any changes. And then when you're ready, you, he wants it printed on um, uh, archival paper and two copies, and then mailed to, to him, and and go. They, you go from there. And uh, you get. You must prove your relationship, and they will accept a collateral relationship. So the. The person that fought in the War of 1812, it could be his sister, his brother, you know, not, not your direct line all the way back, but it could be someone else in the family. It would be your, uh, your great uncle or aunt, great, great, great uncle or aunt. <laughs> so they do accept that. Now, I did I fail to mention that in the 
uh, Sons of the American Revolution, you have to prove your direct line. Maybe let me get back to that one a bit. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> no, there. We'll, no, that's not the right one. I got to go do this. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. Let's see. No, I need to get my. Oh, it's hiding underneath that little light <laughs> icon. I think there it is. No, it's not. But anyway, let me see if I can get back and of show. Well, let's have to start over. Huh? It said great grandparent, though. So I would. I had a question about that. Uh, well, I mean, great. You know, num whatever number of greats it is. But I, okay. I can't seem to get back to this. I've got to start again. There we go. I'll play. And uh, oh, it's it didn't change. Okay, so I X that out. And I go back this way. Oh, and it's got the icon. I'll move that over. Won't let me. So I'll do that. There we go. And then I'll move this back and then I'll say play. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to go back to. Um, yes. Yeah, so, okay. Up on the top. I failed to mention it had to be a direct line. You can't uh, uh, write from you to the Patriot, otherwise, you know, all the way from, you know, bloodline from you to the Patriot. And if you're adopted, you can't do it. Or if somebody in, along the line is, it's, it has to be a direct bloodline. So moving right along back to the War of 1812, we got, there we go. So this one allows a collateral relationship. Now it's time to change hats again. We're in my the head of the, my relative that fought in the Civil War, he was 55 years old when he joined the um, Union Army in uh, Kentucky. And uh, he went to the Battle of Shiloh as his first thing. Now, you have to keep in mind that they only allowed people, they would only draft people up to age 40 in the Civil War. And if you were over that, you didn't have to go, but he decided he was fighting. <laughs> so he went all the way to the Battle of Shiloh, promptly fell off a cliff and, and injured his whole one side of his body. So they shipped him back to back home after the battle. <laughs> and uh, he it, got a medical pension for the rest of his life. And one advantage of that, I had records on it. You would not believe because every year he had to have a physical, he had to fill out all kinds of forms, you know, the government. <laughs> So we had a lot of stuff for that, but he, so anyway, getting to um, the Sons of the Union Veterans of Civil War. Now they have 7,000 members nationwide. So, um, and they do, they are direct, uh, the fraternal organization is de direct, dedicated to preserving history and uh, legacy of our veteran heroes who fought and worked to save the Union in the American Civil War. It was organized in 1881, Charted by Congress in 1954. This is not, yeah, this is the Sunion Union veterans, but their heir is the Grand Army of Republic. So the Sons of the Union veterans was kind of a adjunct to the GAR when they existed, similar to the American Legion and the Sons of the American Legion. So if you have a relative that like your grandfather or great grandfather or grandmother fought, you could become a son of the American uh, Legion in that case. In this case, you could become a um, member of the Sons of the Union Veterans. Now there is a women's organization and they also have a, you know, it's, it's not called that, but it's called the same thing that they were called during the Civil War, which a relief society. They'd actually provide uh, relief to um, uh, the soldiers or visit the battle sites and uh, help the soldiers and sort of gather supplies for uh, in case uh, somebody had nothing left after the battle. They didn't have clothing. They didn't have medical equipment. They'd gather all that together and present that to the soldiers. So um, uh, I'll go to my next slide. Uh, these are some examples around the country. Uh, the upper left is uh, a monument that's being rededicated or uh, by a group of people from Connecticut, I think it is, I can't remember up there by when I read it, I, I think, oh, Maine, it was Maine. 
and so that's in Maine. This is a national thing. This is on the right, the national headquarters of the um, Sun the Union Veterans of the Civil War, and it's in uh, Pennsylvania, and um, it's actually in the Civil War Museum. And uh, the lower left is uh, our where we meet in Peoria. I'm a member of the. Uh, uh, the camp that meets in Peoria, and this is the old GAR Hall. And those are all stained glass windows. That that metal is for the GAR that's hanging. You know, it's actually part of the stained glass window. It's really beautiful, and there's a lot of history in that building. And out, on either side, in the front, are a stack of mortar balls that are about this big, about twelve balls, solid steel. And then on the other side is this mortar that's about this big at the barrel. And it has the center, you know, that drops those balls in. <laughs> so I would not, not like to get hit with those things. So those are still there in Peoria. I guess I moved it back. <laughs> uh, somehow I moved it. I don't know how I did it, but whatever. Maybe I can do arrows and get back to that. Hey, look at that at work. I had never tried that with the keyboard. <laughs> so and the other one on the right, lower right, is at Lincoln's tomb. And they have a, on his death day, they have a, celebration and they also have one there uh, on Memorial Day. Now what they, they consider Memorial Day is always the 30th. That's the way it was for years. Sometimes they move it around this now, depending on how it fits up on a weekend, but they do it on that, that day. <laughs> and that's Remembrance Day. It's my so, birthday and I believe that. Yeah, right. So anyway, there's a lot of wreaths and so forth that are brought by various organizations. Some of those ladies in the front are from the women's organizations and some of the men and women are there either in the Sons of the Union Veterans or they, there's another thing called Sons of Veteran Reserve and that's more or less the uniformed organization within the Sons of the Union Veterans that uh, you know meets and does various things in the color guard and so uh, that's that and the camps are located are the local organization uh, and the head is the camp commander. Everything is military because it's all, you know, from that era. And uh, I'm in the Colonel John C. Briner 67 camp in Peoria, which is about 96 miles from here. But we have members in Viola, which is not too far from here, right? Uh, there are 10 camps in Illinois and five in Iowa. The closest one here is in Dubuque, the Robert Mitchell camp, 206, which is about an hour away north of here. And, uh, and we meet every month, or I'm sorry, every other month. So we'll be meeting uh, in August and then we won't meet until October and so on. And uh, the department is the state level and the head is the department commander. And, and the Illinois department meets at three times a year around the state at different camps, uh, depending on how things work out. And the national headquarters is at the um, National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and the head is the commander in chief. And they meet once a year uh, at a national encampment. They used to actually, uh, the GAR actually used to camp in tents, you know, up till they closed the thing down because the last member <laughs> pretty much died, you know, of the fought in the Civil War. Um, so and they meet once a year and they discuss business and take tours of various things. And they meet at historic sites like the Gettysburg Battlefield or, you know, a uh, this time in Harrisburg. So um, anyway, moving right along. Membership, uh, it's hereditary. Now there's different kinds of membership in the, Sun Union, of the U Sons of the Union Veterans. You can be a hereditary member, which means you have to prove your relationship, or you can be an auxiliary member. So you can, you can actually be a non-member that just likes the Civil War and wants to be a part of it. And uh, so, and if you must be not convicted of a heinous crime and you and your membership, uh, for you and your membership ancestor, otherwise you, he can't have deserted. <laughs> and we get a lot of that because, you know, they, sometimes they count people as deserted when they, they couldn't find them or whatever, but if you can prove, in fact, he did get an honorable discharge thing, you know. So, um, <clears throat> and must never bore arms against the USA. You must be directly descended from a soldier, sailor, uh, 
Marine or a member of the Revenue Cutter Service. And collateral ancestral is possible. You could be the grand uncle, your grand uncle or, or aunt could be the one that did the service and, you know, instead of a direct line. And again, it's a, you have to go to the Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War and uh, download a PDF file, a fillable application, and then uh, you can send it on to the, the camp that you're involved with. They recommend you get hooked up with a camp and you can go to the um, Sons of Union Veterans.org website and find out where the local camps are. And then call, they give you connect contacts so you can get a hold of them, either email or phone and uh, tell them you want to be a member and they'll tell you what the local dues are. Now, the one in Peoria um, is a $50 dues, which are pretty reasonable actually. And uh, there's a $10 fee and that includes the national dues. So uh, it's all for 60 and then each camp dues are different and the fees are different as well. Thank you, Catherine. I'm happy to be here today. I have been a member of the Colonial Day since 1994. Um, my mother was active and her friends decided it was time for me to join. <laughs> so I joined through my colonial ancestor in New Hampshire, John Sanford. He was a, a, a lieutenant in the, in the military coalition militia and helped found it, uh, county, New Hampshire. The National Society of the Colonial Dames of America is a nonprofit, nonpartisan women's lineage organization founded in 1891 by a group of women in Philadelphia. Today, we are an unincorporated association of 44 corporate societies with approximately 15,000 members. The National Society headquarters is located in Washington, DC. Our membership includes women of varying age, ethnicity, religion, education, and profession. The organization is a women's lineage society and its membership is limited to those whose line of ascent can be traced to men and women who rendered service in the colonial states prior to 1776. Each colonial state society has specific requirements for qualifying service of ancestors and its own list of eligible ancestors. There are currently more than 10,000 approved ancestors. 39 of them are women, although I think the number is actually higher now, and one actually includes Pocahontas. <laughs> and our goal is to reach 250 women uh, in time for the 200th anniversary of the country. There, there we go. Thank you. Yeah. What do we do? Well, I included a lot of slides. I'm going to try and talk fast, but maybe I can just click, click, click. Um, <laughs> the dames are affiliated with over 90 historical homes and sites and together own over 190,000 artifacts. In 1896, the New York Society agreed to manage Van Cortlandt House, one of the first historic houses preserved in the U.S. Along with historic homes, the dames have also strived to save, restore, interpret, and maintain America's historical landscape, which includes open lands and gardens. This has been done and continues to be done through historical research and archeological work. We build monuments. In Arlington National Cemetery, there's a memorial to those who lost their lives in the Spanish-American War. It is the first memorial erected by a women's society. And today we have a plaque that honors all who served and lost their lives in the war. At Plymouth Rock, we built a granite uh, portico to protect the rock. And it was built to uh, in time for the 300th anniversary of the landing. On the National Mall in Washington, DC, there is a lifelike large sculpture of George Mason, author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the owner of Gunston Hall Plantation. We've reconstructed historic sites. In 1907, to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the landing of the English settlers, we rebuilt the Jamestown Church on the site and foundation of the original 1616 church. The National Society preserves three museum houses. Dumbarton House, which is our national headquarters, is an early 19th century federal period style house in DC. It was owned by Robert Norse, the first register of the US, 
And when the British burned the White House during the War of 1812, First Lady Dolly Madison had did her on the table, finally left with George's portrait under her arm and went by carriage a few miles down the road to Dumbarton House. And that's where she took shelter. We managed Gunston Hall, an 18th, uh, mid 18th century Virginia plantation on the Potomac River in Mason Neck, Virginia. And you see the boxwood surrounding the path that leads to basically an overview of the river. And this other photo there is, is the architect's drawing. One of the most recent projects has been to restore the area to the original gardens, besides the boxwood and the herbs and vegetables and flowers. And then the land slopes down dramatically uh, to the Potomac. And George Washington was his neighbor up the river or down the river, I guess. <laughs> Up the river, I think. <laughs> At any rate, um, they kind of fell out of friendship because George Mason signed the Declaration of Independence, but he refused to sign the Constitution because it lacked a Bill of Rights. And he had authored the Virginia Bill of Rights. So those two men did not speak until shortly before their passing and finally reconciled. And we also um, support. Soulgrave Manor, which is the ancestral home of his family. Lawrence Washington was given land by King Henry VIII in 1539, and we um, fundraise and help keep, keep that going as a museum house. One of our most recent projects has been to kind of unite all of these properties into a website and what we call an alliance, and it is to help promote the treasures that we have to make them known on online so people can get a virtual tour and learn more about them. If they're planning trips, there are aids for that as well. And it's um, it, it's kind of helped present our organization in a more public way. We have educational programs, so we give scholarships. We sponsor an essay contest every year and the winners attend the Washington workshops in Washington, DC. Um, usually they're sophomores, juniors, seniors in high school. And they always say it's a life-changing experience after they get back, the, the Washington workshops, pretty special. We offer one um, adding them scholarship every year. The history day at, for the element at the Iowa Cow is a little bit out of sync. I'm, this is my national side of the presentation, but it was such a nice picture, I stuck it in because there's uh, the Des Moines Day sponsor a fourth grade class every year for History Day at, at Iowa and they learn how the government works and um, they've done a great service that way. And then one of our longstanding scholarship programs is the American Indian Medical Scholarship. We welcome new citizens at naturalization ceremonies. We honor our veterans by recording oral histories of their experiences. A newer program is to support the vet dog program to assist veterans and their families. And we participate in Reese Across America every year. And now as far as the Iowa Society goes, um, it was started in 1896. We currently have 130 members, about a third of them live in Des Moines and they meet as a Des Moines group. The other third are in the Eastern half of Iowa and we call it the D Davenport Borough, but it includes Dubuque, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, Muscatine, Todd Cities. Um, and the other third actually live out of state and are not really active, but they have a connection to Iowa. The founders, um, the first one that I wanted, wanted to just talk a little bit about a few of them was Mrs. William Stevens Perry, and her main name was Sarah Abbott Wood Smith. She was the wife of the second Episcopal Bishop of Iowa. And in 1896, she gathered 11 women in her home to organize the Iowa Society. Her husband, Bishop Perry, was instrumental in founding St. Catherine's Girls School, the Kemper School for Boys, St. Luke's Hospital and numerous other churches. She was our first member, founder, and president. And then just a little bit about a couple other of our founders. Mrs. Charles Schaefer, maiden name Evelyn Schuyler, was born in New York and married her husband in Ithaca. He served as the dean at Cornell University before his appointment 
1887 as the president of the University of Iowa. And she herself was an author of many published stories, novels, and articles. Another founder was Mrs. Samuel Francis Smith, married name, or maiden name, Mary Reed. And she was born in Fairfield, Iowa. And her father-in-law, Samuel Francis Smith Sr., wrote the lyrics to the song, My Country Tis of Thee. Well, that was kind of neat. Um, Mrs. Leon Menard Allen, maiden name Catherine Augusta Ballard, was also a founder, and her mother was also a founder, Mrs. Isaac Steer Ballard, maiden name Frances Arilla Webb, and they were descendants of William Bradford of Massachusetts. Mrs. Ballard was born in New York and came to Davenport with her parents. She married a pharmacist who was also a genealogist and helped many of the early Iowa dames with their membership papers. The Ballards were founding members of the Calvary Baptist Church. She was the mother of three colonial dames, Catherine, whom I've already mentioned, um, Elizabeth Ballard, and Belle Ballard Richardson. She was the great-grandmother of Alice Richardson Sloan. Mm -hmm. And Alice and her husband, Ted, were certified mm -hmm. genealogists. They helped so many women become colonial dames, and they were very generous benefactors to the Special Collections Library. Mm -hmm. Always have to honor Alice. <laughs> yep. Probably our most famous and possibly notorious sounding member was Miss Alice Virginia French. Um, descended from George Morton of Massachusetts. She was born in Andover and came to Davenport with her parents. I think her father was in the railroad industry. Um, she attended Vassar and graduated from Abbott Academy in Andover. She traveled extensively through the United States and Europe. She traveled in literary circles on the East Coast and became the foremost writer of American fiction in her time using the pen name Octave Thanet and her books are on the shelf in the Special Collections Library. She served as the Iowa Society president for 20 years and was the first colonial dame from an associate state to be a national officer. What do we do? Well, the Iowa dames do not own a museum property and we're very thankful that we don't <laughs> because it requires so much fundraising to cover operational costs and staff. But we are stewards of Plum Grove, which was the home of the first territorial governor of Iowa. And the state historical society owns the grounds, but we are stewards of the furnishings with um, period pieces from 1844 to 1853. His wife was named Friendly, and she had a garden which is maintained, and um, they have a taste of Plum Grove every year where they actually make food and have a big festival. But, um, Cody Homestead near McCoslin was built in 1847 by Isaac Cody. His, he was the father of Buffalo Bill, and it was Buffalo Bill's childhood home for a few years. The home was built from native limestone and contains walnut floors and trim. The home was later purchased by the McCoslin family and they added more rooms to the house. The Iowa dames have furnished the living room in simple early Victorian style pieces and furnished one of the bedrooms in 1870s period decor. The property is owned by Scott County Parks Commission and both of these historic sites teach the lessons of life in our state 175 years ago. The Iowa dames established a monument to Lewis and Clark in 1936 on the bluffs overlooking the Missouri River in Council Bluffs to honor the expedition of Lewis and Clark in 1804, and it was later renovated in 2002. The Iowa Veterans National Cemetery, which is located 10 miles west of Des Moines off I-80 inter Interstate, um, was one of our projects where we volunteered and became friends of the cemetery to enclose the committal shelter with glass windows and doors. And if you've ever been to the Rock Island Cemetery in January for Camilla, you know how cold it is. So th this sits up high on a hill that's very windy in the town. So we were very happy to do that. The USS Iowa Naval Battleship, um, we contributed toward its conversion to a living museum. It re was retired in San Francisco in that photo, but it steamed out of there to its final 
birth in Los Angeles, and it now offers all kinds of leadership programs for youth. You probably recognize this one. We helped contribute towards the restoration of the Forest Grove Schoolhouse. We participate in Reese Across America, but as you can see in the in the narrow picture there, the Iowa or the Des Moines dames and their families totally outnumber us <laughs> at the Rock Island Cemetery. <laughs> but it's been a very worthwhile project to participate in. The Des Moines dames donate gifts and baskets every year to the Women's Center at the VA um, Central Iowa Health Care System. In 2016, the Iowa Society was presented with the NSEDA's Award for Excellence for its collaboration with the Eastern Iowa Community College, the Putnam Museum, and the Plus 60 Group for several Learn with Lunch events that involved a luncheon open to the public and a presentation by a reenactor such as Thomas Jefferson on the right, George Washington in the center, and um, Elizabeth Schuyler, who was the wife of Alexander Hamilton. Um, some of them went to school groups to make their presentations, and in other cases, we bust groups to the Putnam Museum. COVID kind of stopped us in our tracks for a few years, so we're still in the process of rebuilding and we're trying to get back up to speed. But we have learned um, to make use of websites and, and social media to try to tell our story and get our message out. And I probably didn't include enough about actual membership, but as a registrar, I do help uh, candidates prepare their lineage papers and uh, love doing the research. Been doing that for a long time. So um, thank you. But you where, where is your list uh, by state of those uh, patriots or those people that are recognized to be um, uh, official ancestors? We, we have what's called a Register of Ancestors that is online. It's on our website, and I'm not sure that it's accessible to anyone but the members, but I can find out. Okay. <laughs> I, I have access to it. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Sam. Oh, yes. And I, I brought the real camp to there a little bit later, but you're welcome to take us. And we'll take more questions at the end if we have any. Um, but now we'll have Mary yeah. who's going to talk about our Center for Belgian Culture. Which right. Is so this is the one of these things that's not like the others part of the presentation. Um, I'm here for the Center um, for Belgian Culture of Western Illinois and the Belgian Museum. And I've got our website down there. So we can talk about reasons to join. And you can do so by going to this website. Myself, um, I'm retired from IT, and I'm glad to put a check mark on that work yes, career because yes. I've got all this time now to research genealogy. Um, so I'm here for the Center for Belgian Culture. I'm their board secretary and their genealogist. I'm also, you know, we all have membership issues with sheer numbers. Um, I'm also the um, webmaster, the social media person, and the newsletter editor. So we're always looking for more members. I'm a member of the Rock Island County um, Illinois Genealogy Society. I'm their member at large. I also volunteer at the English Surf Center, so I you know, recognize the faces that I've seen out um, on Wisconsin um, at the center. And I belong to the Genealogical Society of Flemish Americans. So Flemish are one of the ethnic groups that are from Belgium. And then I also belong to a society in Belgium. You know, that assist with research. But the reason I'm here, I'm a second generation American. I am the very, very proud grandchild of four Belgian infants. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history on Belgians in America and why Belgians are significant for the Quad Cities. And if you look at these gentlemen, there is one right here, Grandpa. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is circa 1914. These guys just filed their first papers and were on that path to citizenship. In the 2020 census within the U.S., or I should say North America, because we're talking Canada too, 348,000 people with Belgian um, ancestry. Now you were talking about 34,000 people in the SAR. Um, that was 34,000 people in 2020 in Illinois. 
and Belgian ancestry. So we're not a big ethnic group. Um, but some of the, the immigration to the US and Canada, um, some of our famous Belgians or famous waves of immigration, Father Louis Hennepin, he was the first European to lay eyes on the Niagara Falls. We call that discovered Niagara <laughs> Falls, but he was the first European to see it. Um, some of the waves of immigration started with our French speaking Belgians coming to Wisconsin in the 1850s. The Walloons, as we call them, kind of experienced the uh, classic cottage industry in Belgium and needed to go somewhere to make their money. So they were the first among the first groups to come. If you discount some of those early ones who helped formation of New York. Um, in the late 19th century, New York, New Jersey, Manitoba, Ontario, Minnesota, Wisconsin, those were big draws for Belgians. Now, my grandpa was part of this next big wave, the early 1900s, where they started coming to Detroit and Moline. And then if you've ever looked at who lives in Anawan, Atkinson, Geneseo, those areas, there are a lot of bands and Ds, you know, whether they're Vandevortes, Smiths, that kind of thing, too. A lot of Belgians congregated in those areas, too. Mishawaka, South Bend, Indiana. So this is a display about Moline. And this is actually in Antwerp, Belgium. They're talking about Moline, Illinois, and the draw. I, I was so surprised to go to Belgium and see displays. And it's like, I know those people, <laughs> you know? But they had uh, uh, you know, donated materials to the Red Star Line Museum in Antwerp. So it was really cool to see on Moline. And what they talk about is Belgians in the Quad Cities, the Moline area, were the second largest group of immigrants, okay? Largest group, the Swedes, with 3,600. But 1,600 Belgians, and when you think about it, those 34,000 Belgians in Illinois, that is still only a third of 1% of the population of Illinois. Illinois in 2020 had over 15, or yeah, over 15 million people. Belgium only has 11 million people. So again, it, it's significant. In 1920, 22% of the immigrants in Moline were Belgian. And they came to Belgium because employment. You know, we didn't leave Belgium because we we're millionaires. We came here because we needed money. We needed to support families and thrive. So they found work at Deer. My grandpa, Phil, not the one in the slide, he actually started in six months of coming to the U.S. in 1911. He started working at Deer Mansur Works, and he retired in 1958 as plan foreman, plant foreman of Plow Planner. So he was so proud of that um, industrial background. They also came to farm, and this was their first chance to own land and farm land for a lot of these people because the family farms, as soon as 12 of the 15 children start surviving, you can't split up those family farms anymore. So they came over here to farm. And then they came and they, um, you know, they were in trade, you know, carpenters, you know, bricklayers, all those folks came here. Um, and we have a lot of immigrants. <laughs> Um, and Moline really provided that social and cultural interaction that they needed. We had a Flemish newspaper from the 1900s to 1940, a Flemish language newspaper, and it carried news about, hey, what's going on in South Bend, Indiana with all those Belgians? You know, so it had little society columns. My dad was in there when he came home from the hospital, and he had people from camp go visit him after his appendix came out, and it was all in Dutch, Flemish, you know, their language. So that was cool. And they were also drawn uh, to activities, pigeon racing. I didn't even tell them to race on the pigeons, <laughs> but we actually, at the Museum of Remote, we have a book full of what they call pigeon diplomas. You know, they flew this far and all that kind of stuff. So it was a big deal, roly bowl. That is kind of like a bocce ball, kind of horseshoes kind of game. Came from East Flanders and it's still played here. In fact, they're talking about expanding the leagues to allow more people to play roly-poly. And then we've also had an honorary consulate 
a lot of the honorary consulates or the consulates in the U.S. They're in New York, Chicago. We have one in Moline. So Patrick Ben Neville, our honorary consul, he's going to celebrate his 20th year representing the folks of Belgium, um, kind of helping people with passport issues, um, you know, getting in touch with family, that sort of thing. And then I've been doing a project where um, I'm going through the 1930 census, kind of just going through it right now. And I started looking at just five blocks. And in five blocks in Moline, I found 245 people of Belgian ancestry, 64 distinct households. And it's kind of interesting because it's like Sweden, Belgium, 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 Sweden, mm -hmm. Sweden. <laughs> you know, so this little area in Belgium. And then this article, I like it because it talks about the Belgians that, hey, they are sturdy, stocky people, <laughs> capable of doing a great deal of hard work. They are not disposed to embroil themselves or disturb their neighbors, just all around yeah, people. Yeah. So I like that slide. So anyway, the Center for Belgian Culture. This is where we differ from a lineage society. We're all about preserving and sharing our heritage. We're all about teaching our kids what it means to have this background. And we accept anybody, regardless of their ethnic affiliation. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it's just a matter of, you like to eat waffles, drink beer, have a good time, you can join our club. So $35, that's our annual membership. And then some of the things that we do, um, we have volunteer opportunities. We have a monthly waffle breakfast fundraiser, and that was this morning. Mm -hmm. and it's they very have, good. Yes, yeah. it's very good. Um, we have music from the Happy Belgians, and this is another big uh, Quad City tie-in for us. So Omer Van Spyro, who is the great-grandfather and grandfather of some of the guys in the band, he was the first Belgian jazz musician, and he played with Big Spider back. Mm -hmm. So his grandson and great-grandsons play at the Waffle Breakfast, and they're, they're fun to listen to. They're a nice job. And of course, St. Nick comes in December. And then on Sunday, September 17th in Stevens Park, we're going to have carriage rides, bands, roller bully tournament, and food and beverage. So we'll have waffles and wine beer <laughs> and other things, brats and, you know, that kind of stuff. But please follow us on Facebook for sharing details. We are located on 7th Street in Moline, the heart of what we used to call Old Town. Um, and there's our phone number. We're open every Wednesday and Saturday from one to four. We have a little museum where we can highlight some of the things that are cool about our culture. And the second Saturday of every month, we have lace makers because Belgians were known for their intricate lace, their, their bottom lace that they made. And we still have women who learned from their grandmas and great grandmas how to make lace. And then we're also working on our displays. We received a generous donation. We're going to try to do some uh, kind of interactive content. So some of our offerings, um, we're not just about genealogy and planning and family history. Um, we're also about scholarship. Uh, this year, we awarded a Van Tegum scholarship and four scholarships from the CDC. Um, we have requirements on our website. Um, but we had um, kids that are college bound, you know, wrote about what heritage means to them and were awarded scholarships. Um, we do speaking engagements. Um, one of the ones that was really cool this year is the Illinois National Guard has existed for 300 years. So in Springfield, they had um, a ceremony to recognize that. There was a specific Belgian tie in is that this is the unit of service man who during World War II rescued Leopold III, King of the Belgians, from the Nazis. So we had Belgian representation at that uh, to recognize that fact. We do a monthly newsletter. Um, and again, it's, it's keeping that heritage alive. You know, some of this stuff, you know, we're covering that newsletter. Occasionally I put, you know, for filler and put a recipe in there. But, um, you know, that Titan sub that sank with the billionaires. Yeah. You know, going to the Titanic, you put an article in there, you know, who are the Belgians aboard that boat mm -hmm. who were lost mm -hmm. in the Titanic? My grandpa, thank goodness, 365 days before the Titanic sunk, hopped on a ship, same shipping line, you know, same water line, whatever. So, you know, it just gives me the chills to think what might have happened had we waited a year. Mm -hmm. 
But anyway, those are the kind of things we cover in the newsletter. Um, and then family history. So for our members, we do one free query um, a year. And lately, a lot of the queries I get are not from the US, they're from Belgium. They're for people looking for family. Mm -hmm. We've done research for, um, I've done some DNA work on somebody who had family, um, a Belgian man who had been on one of the ships that was sunk at Pearl Harbor. They were wanting to know, okay, who, who is in the DNA mm -hmm. on me? You know, that we can kind of match up. So I've done work. Mm -hmm. um, we did some research work for a television program that they had in Belgium. You know, identifying family. But anyway, we have some fun, fun family history projects we've done. And I'm also teaching Belgian genealogy Zoom classes in conjunction with Ribs. So that's been fun because we've had, you know, I, I don't know if we just didn't do that in the US and teach that kind of research, but I've got folks from Virginia and Hampshire and, you know, all over the country who are participating in that. So the center has quite a few holdings um, to help with family research and genealogy. We have um, sort of family histories. We have collections of obituaries. We have those little death memorial cards and great immigration records, reference materials, compilations. And this is one of those compilations. And these are, I think, this has given me a lot of joy when folks come in and they say, oh, my great, great grandpa was Belgian, that kind of thing. These are books that were uh, compiled in Belgium where they've gone and they've cataloged all the Belgians in the US. And I've got two volumes there of Belgians in Iowa and Illinois. So, you know, um, when we're at fest and stuff and people, you know, they find, you know, their family in here, it's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So those are some of the compilations. So a little more on Belgian uh, genealogy and I'm gonna try to kind of go quickly through this. Belgium's a fairly young country. You know, we've only existed since 1831. The Belgian National Day is July 21st, and it basically celebrates the ascension of Leopold I to the throne. And if you watch Victoria on PBS, she called him Uncle Leopold. So, um, you know, one of those royal houses in Europe. Belgium's been invaded quite a bit twice by Germany. It's previously, you know, prior to 1830, all the way back to the 1500s. It's been Dutch. It's been French. It's been Austrian. It's been Spanish. You know, looking at some of these records, one of the godparents on one of my ancestors was Diego. Diego L or whatever. But, you know, they were part of the Spanish Netherlands. Um, it's almost exclusively Roman Catholic. So Council of Trent required all these Catholic churches to keep records. That's been great because I can, you know, look at Latin church records in the 1600, no problem. They've also had a very active court system going back to the Middle Ages, books of citizens, state records, orphan registries. And I've had great fun because I recently found my eighth great grandfather in court records from 1699. Unfortunately, he was under arrest for instigating a riot. Uh, but he got off because he brought defense witnesses and they all stated it was on account of his bad behavior of his wife. So he was, uh, you know. But anyway, I'm like, this is genealogy, Jack. can go back. Read records or you know obtain records online back to 1600. That's fun. So those court records are a who. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Belgian genealogy, family search in the National Archives. Between the two of them, we can go back sometimes into the 1500s, 1400s, and get those records. Um, and then Belgium in 2019, they said, you know what? We're not going to make these records for 100 years anymore. They're opening up debt records for the last 50 years, um, and they're working with Family Search to get those things on the way. And then Jenny and Ed, that's been invaluable to me. So my personal journey, how I got involved in this, I was born in Davenport, went to Holy Family School, Assumption High School, that kind of thing. There weren't a lot of Belgians. And we started talking about family identity and family history, and we had everybody else. I'm a little bit German. You know, somebody fought in the American Revolution. A little bit, you know, Dutch, all this kind of stuff. My parents told me I was Flemish. That's it. <laughs> That's it. I had no idea what it meant to be Flemish. You know, so I started looking up, well, who are Belgian Americans? You know, who are my people? That kind of thing. And that's what got me started. You know, and I found out Henry Ford 
actually has Belgian ancestry because his mother was a child of Belgian immigrants who was adopted by Irish Americans. You know, it's amazing the amount of you know, number of people that you find out that got, you know, some Belgian ancestry. Um, but anyway, so I started building my tree. I started going as far back as I could, and then I started going wide. And part of that, I feel like I'm doing my own niche society. <laughs> because I've always been looking for context and affinity, how am I like, you know, how are we related, that kind of thing. And it was interesting when I joined Riggs, because the president of Riggs, Ann Noyce, she's my cousin. <laughs> you know, and she's not even just my cousin, she's my ninth cousin, but we are related on 30 different lines. <laughs> society, you know, they live in probably an area that's smaller than mm -hmm. they've been there for 600 years. Yeah. Stuff happens. So the same thing. Is the gene pool needs more chlorine. I have that. Sad. And I don't have a family tree. I have a tree. And that's kind of what it is. But part of that is, and you know, came to these conclusions because I was looking for connectedness with other people. Okay. And so what I've been doing is I've created kind of my own list of gateway families. And, you know, what is my connection to historical figures? You know, where am I at in this journey? And it's helped me help others as a genealogist find that same connectedness. So we take a couple of approaches. I like to, when we do genealogies or help people with their genealogies, what is your connection to history? Because one of the record sets that we can take a look at, you know, if they've got a male relation that was born between 1780 and 1800. Guess what? Let's take a look and see if your relative was conscripted by Napoleon. Okay. And we found a lot of those records where, you know, they were, you know, grabbed to fight in Spain or that kind of thing. But anyway, I digress. I'm getting a little too deep on this. But anyway, I try to match them up to prominent lines, normal house, uh, noble houses, and, you know, common, you know, uh, there are certain names that kind of you know, ring off bells. You know, when, when you're saying Sanford, I'm like, oh, my girls have Sanford ancestry. <laughs> um, anyway, these are some of my cousins. So this is what I found on my journey. So probably maybe like 10 years ago, I got contacted by somebody through your 23 me DNA. And I met my third cousin, Thomas Lambert. So he is currently the Belgian ambassador to Luxembourg. He's been a UN representative. <laughs> He's a lawyer and economist, but it was one of those things we met on 23 me and had the opportunity to meet him in Washington, D.C. and the embassy. And anyway, third cousin. So we share some common parents. Um, we also have a culture, culturally significant author in the family. My sixth cousin is a gentleman by the name of Sage Struggles. So he wrote some very important novels. He um, not that there's a good try award for a Nobel Prize, but he was the uh, runner up for the Nobel Prize for Literature Theater that um, it was awarded to Pearl Buck. So he is a, a prominent author. Family um, in the arts. So an expressionist painter, Edgar Tate. I can't say that. <laughs> but anyway, seventh cousin once removed. And then when I went to Belgium in 2019, I was pleased to see that my fifth cousin, three times removed, had statues all over Belgium. Mm -hmm. So he was the poet laureate uh, for Belgium. Um, there are entertainment figures. Um, one of my cousins is a Belgian singer and was kind of a teen uh, actress. She's now a clinical psychologist and prominent researcher at the University of Ghent. So Lauren Doric. Uh, Noemi Merlant. So, did anybody see the movie Tar? Or perhaps you saw ads for it, but it was a recent Kate Blanchett movie. She was in that movie with Kate Blanchett. And then um, there's also quite a few Belgian born, or, or rather British born individuals who actually have Belgian backgrounds. These are a couple of my cousins. My 10th cousin is Dirk Bogart. So, he was actually born with the name Bondin Bogart. Uh, Susan Janet Valian, this one's going to be a little more obtuse for a lot of people here, but there was a punk band called Susie and the Banshees. Susie Sue is actually the child of a Belgian father, and she is my 10th cousin. 
And last but not least, meet my cousin, the queen. So the queen of Belgium, Queen Mathilde, and again, some of those gateway families. One of those families is the Vox. It's a family that actually came out of the Netherlands in the 14th century. And she and I are descended from the same individual and actually related to her on four lines. And then my other cousin, the late Prince Frenier III, and his children, Caroline, Stephanie, and the current Albert II. Okay, cousins. But anyway, these are the kinds of things that I like to, when I work with folks on family history, give them a little historical content. What was, what was your family doing in 1782 when that volcano erupted in Iceland and famine swept the land? You know, that kind of thing. We've been able to find some of those connections. The soldiers for Napoleon and where it exists, connections to some famous relatives. Hopefully I didn't speak too fast. <laughs> that is it. So I did bring um, some rigs. Pamphlets, if you're interested, also brought my card. And if you have any questions, why don't you Thank you, Mary. Okay. So our last presenter, but last but not least, um, Karen Ward, she'll be talking about the da Daughters of American Revolution. So I'll hand that over to you. Thank you. Fun to figure out where that swap. I did turn. not leave it in a good way for you to. Okay, there you go. I, I am so sorry. Oh, okay. there you go. Okay, thank you. There, now you can use the little arrows. Okay, there. Okay, again, I'm Karen Ward. I've been a member of the DAR since about. 2016, so I'm relatively new. I got thrust into officer pretty quickly. <laughs> um, a lot of you may understand. Um, and you can tell I'm not from here. I, my background, I was raised in Alabama. I was born in South Carolina where my mother was from. But I've lived in Iowa now 27 years, and people tell me I still have the accent. I'm not sure. And I, the, the funny thing is when people would ask me where I moved from, I'd spent the last five winters before Iowa and Minnesota. So I would say, where did you move from? And I'd say, Minnesota. <laughs> then they'd have to figure out how to re-ask the question in some other way. <laughs> okay, and I'm amazed at some of the, the overlap of the purposes of these societies, the same direct lineage uh, requirements as some of them. Um, you know, we're an old organization. We're, you know, a hundred and no. A hundred, yeah, 130, 30 years plus. So we're coming, you know, it's a, a big time for us. We're coming up on an uh, anniversary soon. We're doing a lot of uh, planning and preparing. Three objectives, and I've heard these all also, historical, educational, patriotic. And I kind of feel like if we don't pass this along to our daughters, our, our sons also, but I have three daughters, so it's real important to me. Um, this love for DAR, there's, it's not going to be there. And with our chapter, and I'm sure some of your other, you know, your organization, we're getting older. You know, there's not younger people that are joining so much they're too involved in everything else kind of the same way I probably was so you know I want them to love DAR as much as I do these are the four founding members and the reason they wanted to have an organization for women 
It's because they were blocked from being members of the organization because it was all men. So, you know, these are the ladies that got together. Uh, let me show you. Uh, these are our particular chapters, the Hannah Caldwell chapter. I'm going to show you our, this is our public Facebook group. I'll just show you a little bit about, this is our pres, uh, president general. Her name is Pamela White. She's from Texas. But this is the education luncheon we went to when we witnessed was at Continental Congress in the end of June. Uh, our Continental Congress or national convention, well, international convention is always in D.C. Uh, the DAR owns a big property. I, I can't, I didn't write down the historical value, but it's like the most expensive property owned by women. It's, I don't know if it's DC or probably, probably a big, big spot in the country. And it's huge. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, so it's one of our luncheons, uh, this is the Continental Congress main facility in these lights. So they're glass windows, but they're called lay lights. And this is the opening ceremony. And it, right, this is when the president general comes in. I mean, and it's just amazing to see this. That's her again. And this is me with Diane St. John from Moline. We had a flag day uh, meeting, joint meeting. At, this is the Butterworth House. And uh, I was representing our chapter. And there were probably 10 of us over there. We had a really nice luncheon. So you can find out, this is about the museum. The grand opening. Uh, this is 125th anniversary of our chapter. So we've been around a long time. Okay, I'll get off this and go back to my presentation. Okay, some of the projects we look for have need to meet the educational, patriotic, and historical. Uh, we have monthly meetings. Education is always big. There's, I was a former teacher. There's a lot of former teachers out there since I've involved in uh, genealogy. But we have a lot with veteran support. We, you know, we support the Veteran Center. Uh, we've got a young girl that's actually the president of the Iowa CAR. And her project is tech support for veterans. And she teaches classes, helps them get signed up for things, you know, different agencies, make sure they have different apps on their cell phones. So she goes around and helps at different, like, American legions. Uh, one of our big projects for this past year, we gave books to kindergarten teachers in Davenport and Bettendorf. And that was a total of 52 books. And one thing I'll show you in just a minute, um, the DAR national site has great educational resources for teachers. Some of you, I mean, you can use some of the resources. They're not all, you don't have to be members. And they're very valuable for research. Another uh, big project of ours is the DAR Good Citizen. And we have eight schools that we go to, uh, or we contact they're the Davenport Schools, uh, Assumption, uh, North Scott, Bettendorf, Pleasant Valley. Is it? St. Mark, St. Catherine. No, it's oh, River Line. Line. Okay. Um, so there's eight schools that they we um, 
connect with, and each school names their own DAR good citizen. And this is special to me because I was a DAR good citizen when I was a senior in high school. So I have kind of taken this on as my pet project. I didn't do as well as our, our citizen, good citizen for the year. I, the Hannah Caldwell good citizen was also, her name is Lillian Schaefer. She was from West High School, but um, she was named the district winner. I think she won $500 as our winner. We donate $500. And we usually give it directly to the student and not have to go to the school because there's so many expenses that need to be paid that don't have to be scholarship money. So she won the district. There's four districts in Iowa. And we were fortunate enough, she was named the Iowa uh, DAR Good Citizen and just a lovely girl. Um, you know, we were very proud of her. And I'm a retired Davenport school teacher. So I'm even, I was even more proud that she was from Davenport. Uh, this, again, is our 125th um, anniversary celebration at the Outing Club that we had. Uh, and this is a flag that we need to do some more research to find out exactly what it is. I think it's a lot more valuable and needs to be put somewhere rather than just folded up in a box. And this right here, the girl I'm pointing to, is the girl that's the... C.A.R. president for Iowa. Okay, now I'm going to show you some just some things on our D.A.R. national site. And I'm kind of leaving out some of the things that are duplicates about the lineage societies because I did find that there is a lot of duplication. Although Okay, like I say, I'm from Alabama. I did find out that I could be in the uh, Daughters of the Confederacy. It, they're slave owners, you know, when, when you go through the, the um, census records, you know, if your families lived in the South, that's going to happen. Uh, I'm one that doesn't believe we can change history. You know, it's history. Um, so these are some things of the genealogy listing up here. Maybe. Okay. Yep. And then you can start, and you can go in like the descendants. Well, I'll start with the ancestors database. Now, one thing I find, um, I'll show you, and I'm not signed into this site at all, so you could get in. Um, this person I'm working on, his name was actually Josiah Joseph Wise, but if you put in the Josiah, you don't find him. And you have to put in at least one of these. But this is my ancestor. It tells me the ancestor number for DAR purposes. They are where I'm pointing. It gives you all the records. Uh, there's another one from Massachusetts. I know that's not mine because I know. It, well, I, I just know. I mean, it could be. But I know from the records that I have that my veteran was in the South. Uh, but you go on down and it will, you can do a member lookup. You've got to have more numbers, but then you can do a descendant lookup. And I'm going to use the same name. And this is where you can get a lot of hints. Okay, go on down. 
Okay, let's just so uh, no. So, oh, Margaret Patton. I know that was his wife. So let's go here. <laughs> you know, and so it will give you information that you can use to research over that, you know, back further. As a member, I can log in and find out a lot more information. So, um, but when you click on the ancestor, ancestor for not signing in. Okay, I must skip that. But this GRC gives you more information that's accessible to you. So you can go, you know, use the DAR site, mini Bibles. Uh, you can ask for copy records. They they do charge for that. But as a non-member, I'm just letting you know that there's plenty of resources with the DAR. Uh, the library, when I was there in, in June, I had a chance to spend some time. And this was the original Constitution Hall. But it got so big, they had to build a new one. And I looked up, we've got 190,000 members, it says right now. Now, of our members, we have close to, to 100 in the Quad City. Well, it's mostly because there's one in across the river. In, in Davenport and the Quad Cities, we've got about 100. But active people, I would say we've got 20, you know, that come. So, you know, having active members sometimes is a little bit more difficult. We do try to keep things so that we can get other people there. Okay, I'm going to leave it up to any questions. And it is a direct line. You've got approved lineage. If you're adopted, you've got to show through your family. Yes. If I was verified and became a member uh -huh. in 1969, yes. Um, how could I find out that? Is, would that, my name still be on there? Um, I would have to do a little research, but I would think so. So you've let it lapse? Oh, yes. I was 13 and oh. I just didn't care at the time. And, you know, it was the Vietnam War, and I thought, oh, great. I'm like, I'm going to do this war thing. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. I didn't know what it was. Yeah, my grandmother had done all of the research and got us all paid for everything and got us all. And that's the two daughters that I've done so far. I I paid their membership the you know the right. the application fees. Right. I told them I'll pay your membership right. as long as I'm alive. Yeah. Which we didn't do. She we didn't do that or she didn't. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Let me get your name, number. Sure. And yeah, I, I know it's there somewhere. My sister uh, asked about it. She was really interested. In, and apparently she was told by, in Wisconsin, by the woman that was in charge or that she couldn't do it, that there was a problem or whatever. But I, so. Uh, yeah, I think anything's possible. I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another thing I just thought of, let me see if I can go home. Uh, over, let's find out where it is. There are so many webinars um, mm -hmm. for educational purposes. I can't, not seeing it right this minute. 
but there's so many webinars there. If you're a teacher, there are hundreds of lesson plans with books that specifically go with it, or just lesson plans that would be fantastic. Uh, like I said, we donated the books to the, uh, the kindergarten teachers. We actually printed the lesson plans for them. We put a, a QR code inside the book so that if they lose the papers, they can look up the lesson plans uh, you know, there's so many educational resources that it's just unbelievable. So are there any other questions? Are you, we going to do this as a group? We can open it up to the table and we can start off with Pokey's question. Okay, well, um, let's see, I have a question from Karen. Are there minutes kept from the Scott County or the Davenport D-A-R. Yes. Okay, from, uh, are they available? Um, from early on? Uh, there are some books that they're in. Um, okay. They're in someone's basement right okay. now. I would probably have to know more what you, if you're looking for something uh -huh. specifically. We yeah. talked about getting a, writing a grant to get a, all of our records scanned, um, you know, so they are available. They're, they're not doing us a lot of good sitting in someone's basement. Right, well, the library is a good archive uh, sorting of records. But even, you know, it, I don't, we'd like to have them on a website so they're available, you know, so people could use it for research. Because we, you know, just reading through the minutes, you know, it's very interesting. We found out some very interesting information. But if you want a, something in particular and have an idea about the year, uh -huh. I can see what I can do about getting them. Okay, okay. And your contact information um, is... I no, I don't think I did. Okay. Okay. Uh, my email address okay. is Karen Ward 110 okay. at Gmail. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I have a question for Sally. Oh. <laughs> um, and where's my note though? Um, Oh yeah, the um, the Reese Across America support you mentioned, um, and you showed the Rock Island Arsenal. Do you support cemeteries in Davenport who are participating in that Reese Across America? No, we were just specifically doing it at the National Cemetery in Rock Island okay. for Reese Across America. But in Des Moines, the Woodland has um, cemeteries very historic, and so that's what they focus on. Okay, um, I don't know if you would consider it or not, but I'm on the mm -hmm. partnership for Davenport City Cemetery. And a couple of years ago, um, we participated in that Reese Cross America, but um, would appreciate some financial support. If Is that the help. one on River Drive? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. Okay, uh, DAR was involved in that one, probably, probably, I must say five years, but it's probably more like eight years ago. Uh -huh. We donate also to the Rock Island uh, uh -huh. Arsenal. Uh -huh. If if we go online, would you be listed as one of this, you know, yes. would that cemetery be listed then? Yes, yeah. Sure. We have a Facebook site. Yeah. Definitely. But are you you must be listed through Braves of America also? You know, I don't know. I don't know about Braves Across America because we didn't do it consistently yeah. annually. Oh, okay. So I don't know if we're on there or not because it was I know well, last year was extremely pandemic. cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was a very nice program. And, um, uh, that would be another to... thing to email me about because we okay. donate quite a bit to that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then <laughs> one more question. Yeah, and okay, well, please go. Oh, <laughs> What's your name and holy family? Uh, Kelsey. 
C A L S Y N. Okay. I went to one of them and did it. Oh, okay. and um, some that uh, a friend was doing research um, uh, at St. Anne's uh -huh. and wondered why there were so many Belgians that went out there. Do you know why? Through farming. Just mm -hmm. farming. Yeah, a lot of it was farming. Um, okay. And these were folks that, you know, had been part of subsistence farming in the old country and gosh, you can buy them here. Okay. Yeah. I actually work as the music director at St. Anne's. So I know there are a few original Belgian families whose descendants are still active. Exactly. And it's Nancy. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Great family. Mike yes. and Chris, John, and yeah. yeah. But they yeah. played a waffles. And the Knowles. Yeah. yeah. The Knowles are original. It was Nancy out there. Nancy, yeah. Nancy Shannon? No. Um, the librarian. Yes. Uh, the retired librarian. Do you remember her last name? They did that uh, project where they collected things and scanned them for people. Um, yeah. <laughs> last name escapes me. But she's the one that wondered. She asked me, why are there so many bells? It was yeah, word of mouth, you know, uh -huh. just word of mouth. And there was something called bacon letters that they used to write. There were letters that they wrote back to the families at home, you know, and some of the things that, and, and they collected because there's collections of them. And things like we don't tip our hat to anybody here. You know, we, you know, we eat meat three times a day. So there was a lot of bragging that went on about how good it was here. And just there's one town, um, like Don, which had 900 people, 300 of them came to the US. So oh, it yeah, was, well, yeah, it was yeah, a lot of them ended up in what cities. Mm -hmm. Just one more. Is the Hannah Caldwell chapter still trying to fix the mausoleum at Oak Haven Cemetery? Or... Since I've been regent, there hasn't been much said about it. Um, I think that might be a little bit larger than our scope. And it's a huge amount that it's going to take to yeah. that. Uh, so. That would have to take. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Yeah. It's big. So <laughs> we haven't, I have not had anything with that come across my plate in the year that I've been the region. I remember it being discussed, but I think that's going to take somebody writing a big grant. Yeah. Yeah. And years ago, it was $100,000. Yeah. Except that that's been several years. So. And one of our concerns was that it may be getting to the point of no return. Yeah. Oh, question for Mary. What kind of music do the Belgians, uh, instruments do the Belgians play? So the Van Spyberg Band, the Happy Belgians, they play saxophone, banjo. I think what else you probably know as well as I do. Um, Mike plays soprano sax, but he yeah, plays a yeah, few other a couple of saxophones. But jazz uh, is big over in Belgium. Interesting. And I remember going over there, this tiny little town. They had this this uh, jazz place called Jazz Club Banana Peel. This was kind of the size of a player. And um, but yeah, I, they love jazz. There was a famous uh, musician, unfortunately, he just passed away not so long ago, named Toots Tillman. So if you're a jazz aficionado, you know, Toots, I think, somewhat famous. Does anyone have any questions from home? And ask oh. the question in the chat, so I don't think there are. But, um, well, if there are any last questions, please, we'll be mingling. We have this, I think mm -hmm. there's no one else in this room. Um, but we used our two hours. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. Don't yeah. Take anybody. <laughs> but our speakers have brought pamphlets and stuff to share with you guys. So bring, share those, get those if you want them. Um, and for the speakers, if you want to leave any of those with me for the special questions, I will totally hand them out to people. Awesome. I'll be shameless. Awesome. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. And but also a plug all of you guys to come to our QC Archives Fair and for our folks that are within the groups 
If you have collections or materials that you want to show off or resources that you want to show off at the Archives Fair, sign up for it. It's October 28th. It's at the Halberg Estate. 